Welcome to Small Pleasures, the podcast that discusses great short stories and greatness in the short story form. My name is Livy Michael and I'm a novelist and short story writer from Manchester, England. And this is Sonia Moore, a short story writer and translator from Paris, France. Bienvenue. We've come together because of a mutual enthusiasm for the short story, although I think our responses and what we want from a short story vary, and we hope that the differences will provide a fruitful discussion. This month, we're discussing It's a Luhumia's short story, Five Years Next Sunday. Sonia, do you want to say something about it? So It's a Luhumia is a Kenyan writer and the 2022 winner of the Kane Prize for African Writing, the 2020 Margaret Busby New Daughters of Africa Award, and the 2021 winner of the Short Story Day Africa Prize. Her work has been widely published in literary journals and anthologies, including Disruption, New Short Fiction from Africa from Catalyst Press, where Five Years Next Sunday was first published in 2021. Such great writing coming out of the Kane Prize. Leila Abulela won it as well. So it's an interesting title. What does it refer to? Lahumu's story was apparently inspired by reports of witch hunts on the Kenyan coast, whereby people with grey hair, usually elderly and said to be practising witchcraft, are banished to remote outposts. And she was curious also about the term used in her mother tongue for rainmakers, who were said to have the rain. And she imagined a protagonist called Pili, who has the power to make that most precious resource rain by growing it in her hair and harvesting it by cutting her hair. Even though Pili's community is suffering from drought, she's shunned by her community for her ability to call the rain. And her fortunes change when a white-skinned man called Seth and his companion Honey take an interest in her hair. And what was feared becomes a source of wealth for Pili's family because Seth's desire translates as income. But this raises tensions within her community and with Honey. And the five-year mark announced in the title is a time at which the hair becomes ripe for calling the rain. So even before the story starts, there's a ticking clock looming over the plot. Amazing. So in terms of technique, the opening paragraph is quite mysterious, isn't it? Its meaning becomes more apparent as the story unfolds. But what do you get from just that opening paragraph? As you say, it's, it is quite mysterious. So I'm sure each person reads it slightly differently. I have found that it helped me to situate a little bit in the story to embed the story. So from Locks, which I read as dreadlocks, I got that I was probably dealing with someone with African or Caribbean type hair. And the hair is described as black, which I read as young. And it's long, so I figured probably female, because in my culture's long hair is a gendered attribute. And the connection with water is made in the second sentence. The locks are said to flow. In the second line, there's a suggestion that there's something taboo about the hair. The protagonist forbids anyone to touch her locks and keeps them covered. And what's taboo is both forbidden and disapproved of and sacred, so powerful. Um, this is reinforced by the reference to water being divine. Yes, there are shifts between the forbidden and the sacred throughout this short story. And um, they're played out in particular in the family relationships. What do we gather about this family? For me, the protagonist emerged as female, partly by the negative juxtaposition with her brothers. Although it's quite late in the story where this is certain pronouns don't appear for a long time for example the protagonist is protected by her brothers when going to fetch water but excluded from their talk and games and the woman Nima uses the protagonist Pili for domestic support and only later do we learn that Nima is the protagonist's mother and Pili is forbidden to address her mother as Ma because of her hair and the father is presented as head of the household, the one who owns the house, and his possessions are presented before he himself is presented, with these words, my father's door. Yes, that phrase is very powerful, isn't it? It suggests a whole range of things. What did you gather from that, just from that one phrase? As you say, it's it's hugely powerful. It, it highlighted for me the positioning of the father's head of the household as owner of goods and wealth and the threat posed by the white-skinned man Seth to the father's position, but also the positioning of Pili as something implicitly owned. Yeah, so a patriarchal society then, and yet the power of the hair seems to have been passed down through the female line by Pili's aunt, perhaps indicating an older, pre-existing society. What do you think is meant by caller? 
a great question because I think that's one of the words that we kind of have to learn and almost invent a meaning to the story educates us as we go along in how it wants to be read. So I understood Kola to refer to the power of a woman and it, as you say it does seem to be specifically a woman to call the rain through her hair. So interesting yes because you'd think this would be an advantage it's a real power in an African country but the primary driver in this society seems to be the need to control female power and then the white man enters into this complex layered society and has a particular effect how do you see Seth in the text Pilly says she smells him before she sees him and that in itself is very powerful yeah it's startling he seems to be characterized by by his whiteness by his thirst and the power that money gives him. Also a sort of fetishistic relationship with black women. Uh, the reference to smell for me seemed to help other him as a white man in an environment where his skin colour marks him out as an outsider, but a powerful one. And his first actions are of transgression, touching Pili's hair, taking her scarf, turning up at her father's door. And when he sniffs her hair in particular, that othering seemed particularly associated with a kind of animalistic instinct, I think. And what effect does he have on Pili's parents? There's a sort of reordering that at first might seem to be beneficial to Pili in that she's recognised. Her hair attracts Seth and Its power is sort of diverted, contained by his desire, and the family benefit from increased wealth. But Pili still can't access her own power. The benefits seem to me to be expressed in Western capitalistic terms. What the parents buy with their wealth are lifestyle magazines, they attend a sports club, they sign up for the Reader's Digest and the Times. And I began to wonder, is this story a kind of parable about the effect of capitalism on Africa? Oh, I like that reading. Yeah, it could be. And I, I love that you're highlighting these things because compared to the ability to make rain, they do seem really almost anecdotal, all these objects of desire. The story is so complex, isn't it? I love that it raises so many questions. It's the sex, gender, sexuality, skin colour, nationality. Uh, for me, a lot of the questions seem to circle around power, who wants what and how far they're able to get that, their agency. And uh, the complex relationship between an individual and what they might be said to owe to the wider community. Yes, it reminds me of the work of Ferdinand de Saussure into semiotics, his work on the signifier and the signified, which are the two main components of a sign. There is no logical connection between the signifier and the signified. So in this story, the relationship between the signifier and signified is destabilized. If you take the object to be the hair, the meaning of the hair shifts rapidly with the shifts in power. So Pili's hair is taboo within the family or her traditional culture, highly desirable to the white man, a source of secret power from her aunt, which we presume may refer to a much older society. And this is significant in that it points to the way in which language works to inscribe and transmit power relationships. The language of this short story is really interesting in other ways, too, in the use of non-standard spelling and Swahili words and phrases, such as Zubida's Munzugu. And, yeah, my Swahili is non-existent, but I'll give this a go. (laughs) (laughs) Um, These phrases are interspersed just a little bit throughout the text, and I like that. And part of the reason I like that is because many years ago I went to Botswana, and I was very struck by the number of languages there were in Botswana. But in order to be published at all, the writers had to write in English. And in Kenya, uh, there are 68 languages, but still the dominant one is English. You have to translate yourself almost into English and this seems to me to be like Luhumia's way of you know interjecting an older language more native indigenous language and saying don't forget this exists too this way of being exists too in my story what did you make of the these kind of phrases and words that occur throughout the short story 
But that journey in Botswana sounds wonderful. Lucky you having no, been able to really, have that. It's but really, it's, uh... really interesting, but it, it just made me kind of humbled, really. I mean, what are my chances of writing a story in Swahili and being published? You know? <laughs> I, don't, I don't have that level of literacy, but it is a really powerful colonial form of oppression to impose a language and to threaten another language with it extinction. Language is always political, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. And this writer has definitely not forgotten that, I think. It's interesting that you use this word humility. I also love language switching. I think probably most people in the world live in more than one language. I have absolutely no scientific reason for saying that. I just sense it must be That's true. probably true, yeah. I think people figure out quite early on which language is the most valorised by society. Uh, I think even yeah. children's investment in learning certain languages reflects their impression of which one is the most valorised. You know, they'll often reject the weaker language. There are wonderful stories about that. And in fact, the great Kenyan writer Nguji Wathiongo published a book in 1986 called Decolonialising the Mind. And in it, he mentions being punished at school for speaking his own language rather than English by being made to wear a placard around his neck in the playground with the words, I am a donkey on it. Um, mm -hmm. So you were punished regularly for using your native language. That is also true of... Um, writers from Scotland, Ireland and Wales, and it's been much written about. And many of those writers have chosen to reclaim their language in various ways. But yes, did you enjoy the kind of glimpses of uh, Swahili language that we get in this text? Yeah, I really did. I loved that. I wished I could bring more to the text uh, beyond what I could get from Google Translate. But I love the sensation of, of reaching for meaning that comes almost uncalled and you feel that all your synapses firing, trying to, to work out what's going on. And I think Lahumia made some concessions to non-speakers of the local language in that she often uses sort of inversion to make it clear what's happening. The example you use, there's a Zubeda's Muzungu and then Muzungu Wanga, which I suppose you could imagine means, I don't know, some sort of possessive. But yeah, I really love the, the sensation that you highlight with this word humble, that you have to sort of read modestly. You can't control the text if it's not all written in the language that you're familiar with. That is a lovely way of putting it. I like that, read modestly, and you can't fully control the text. I think that's right. I mean, do you do that in your own work? Do you switch between French and English? I do, yes, very often. Um, and I tend to write in English, and I suppose that reflects also that there are more opportunities for me, at least, in that, mm. that area. Yeah. Uh, I've started writing in French, but it tends to be more intimate writing, like journaling, uh, dream diaries, that sort of thing. Public yes. writing is in English. <laughs> yes, but that, that is regularly true. So maybe it adds a, a certain layer of intimacy to this story. And certainly it's um, the shopkeeper who uses it initially. And we feel that those people are in a world known to themselves, you know, a kind of more intimate world that they know that has been translated for us in the story. But it, it seems to me to add an extra layer and extra depth what we're saying about this story is it presents a multi-layered kind of portrayal of Africa and of family relationships and of the narrator herself. And while we're on the theme of language, there seems definitely to be a naming theme that runs throughout the story. I looked up the name Pili, which seems to mean second born, but there was also a second meaning offered of miraculous. Seth, Seth was a son of Adam. I haven't quite worked out what that might mean except that Peely says when she first meets him that he didn't look like a Seth which is interesting I can't remember my biblical knowledge is it was reduced these days what Seth actually did in the bible Cain and Abel are the famous children of Adam and Eve and one murders the other and Seth is kind of sent along to heal the grief in a way the third son I think and then there is Seth's companion who's called Honey what do you make of her yeah, it's interesting that you pick up on this this question of naming. Thinking about the gap between signifier and signified, I'm not always sure of the randomness of the signifier, in that 
I think this um, this connection you're making, it reveals the connectedness of words to meaning mm -hmm. and the very rich and very complex roots each word has. I was um, inspired by you digging around in the word pili. I went to look at the word seh, <laughs> on the name of oh. seh. I found it could also be related to an Egyptian god of chaos and the deserts, oh, which perhaps okay. relates to the themes. Yes, yeah, so again, in one culture, it would have one set of meanings, but in another, a very similar name has an entirely different set of meanings, yes. Yeah, and it's impossible to know really which ones mm. are intended, mm. and even if they're intended, it doesn't cancel out the others. Yes. Um, and I was thinking also about the universalness of some things. I think hair is often a gendered attribute, certainly in Western Europe. A lot of fairy tales connect with questions of hair and females with long hair. I think there's one a story about Rapunzel, for example. Yes, it was always a sign of, uh, I think, desirability um, in the fairy tale. I mean, the one we have from the Bible that I can think of has to do with uh, Samson and strength, and there the hair is cut by the woman, Delilah, to rob him of his strength. But it's the same association of hair of power, isn't it? Yeah, there's hair and power. Also, I think there's a sort of, um, there's sexual connotations for women. Yes. Uh, is it Mary Madeline who wipes? Oh, wipes yes. You with her hair? Yes, wipes. Um, and even very recently, my, my grandmother had to keep her hair covered when she went into a church. That um, That is very true, isn't it? You know, we think of that as uh, Middle Eastern, but it was also very much Western and Christian that you kept your hair covered in church and even if it wasn't fully covered, the tradition that women wore a hat in church and men didn't, that was very, I think that's st still going, really. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's certainly within living memory, right? Yes. So, yeah, there are all these these really complex connections. And to come back to your question for Honey, I found it interesting that she picked up on this, um, this substance, uh, which connects with sweetness, the desirability, and Lufumi also plays on this quite explicitly to indicate the attraction of Pili to Honey. I mean, that's true. Um, she isn't described initially as desirable. I think you pick up on the idea of her seeming both sad and childlike. But perhaps first, yeah. Dependent, very dependent, isn't she? Yeah, there's a, a sense that they're sort of similar and that they're both disenfranchised. Yes. So there's a sort of unholy promise in the the potential of mm. this attraction, um, the possibility of something that could go beyond sex and romance to disrupt politically or socially. Mm. And I noticed also that Honey has a, a pixie haircut, which Is again that... indicates a sort of magic potential. Absolutely. And I didn't think of that till you mentioned it. You know, her hair is is mentioned. One of the questions you came up with was, what did I find moving about the story? And that was such a good question for me because it made me think that actually I did not find this story moving, not initially. And I realised that that was because most of what I would consider to be the key moments in it occur in ellipsis. And this has to do with very clever structuring, I think. So the moment when Pilly has to sleep with Seth, we don't really see that, do we? We just gather that it has got to that stage. The development of, of her attraction to honey, uh, that's not really spelled out. And the long period of deprivation in her childhood where she was almost outcast or untouchable, we don't see any of that. The, so this, this use of ellipsis seems to me to focus the attention on the political layering of language and the gendered position of women in that society. It's, it's like kind of more philosophical and intellectual approach, all of them connected by the hair, which is a kind of symbolic feature, which made me think a little bit of Beloved by Toni Morrison, where the beloved of the title is uh, a black woman who was killed as a child, but who returns. And, and she becomes symbolic, but really kind of also physically present throughout the story. Why do you think that we only gather gradually that the relationship with Seth is, is sexual? Well, I got something a little bit different around that. I got that the relationship was sexual from the start, at least in, in Seth's intention. He's introduced as belonging to a local woman, and though claimed as hers, I understood the relationship to be dependent on his attraction to her. 
And because his desire is so easily transferred to pity, I presume that his desire is based not in an attraction for an individual, but a more sort of fetishistic interest in black women. So he's investing them with some kind of, I don't know, some kind of power that he wants to access and own. And he's enchanted by Pili's beauty, or the beauty of her hair rather, but he doesn't even see Pili, he just sees her hair. And he reaches out to touch it when still a stranger, which is such a hugely transgressive act. And he wants to, to seize and own, and all of his actions seem to be characterized by the eye and the hand. And Griselda Pollock talks about how the eye, like the hand, exerts power over another. I agree, there's yes, very, very clever use of ellipsis also. But for me, the, the sexual aspect was built in from, from the start. I mean, I can see what you mean. I don't think we doubt what Seth's motivations are or his interest in Pili is. But you can imagine an entirely different kind of story where this young girl has to go to his door and he opens it and this is the first night that she has to bring herself to sleep with this man for whom she has no attraction whatsoever. She doesn't do any of that and I find that very interesting. And similarly, it comes bang in the middle of the story. Seth is saying, no, you don't like me, you like honey. And that was kind of startling for me. I, I haven't picked up on that at all to that point. So it's, it's another ellipsis, the growth of the attraction. What What's the effect of this, do you think? Yeah, it's, it's such a brilliant line, that one, isn't it? It really yeah. shifts the story forward. I felt a, an attraction to Honey also from the start. But yeah, that line really jolted me to the next step in the story. It's a brilliant way also of highlighting the lack of agency of this character in some respects. It's not her own desire that's moving things forward. And that line highlighted for me the seditious attraction between Honey and Pilly. They're both caught in a system where they're more controlled than controlling and valorised through their relationship to men. And the build is reinforced by that musing, again, on Honey's name, the stickiness of it, its sweetness, how it never goes bad, mm. which foreshadows the end to a certain extent also. Well, it does. And I like your word fetishistic because there is that room that's full of images of black women and it's described as if lined with skin. Yeah. Like the game hunter with yeah. skin. Yeah, I yeah. had the same image pop up. Yeah, the yes. big yeah. game hunters with their trophies. And just to get back, that the, there's one kind of magic through Pilly's hair, but another kind of ritual that is mentioned, which is the ritual of fire. And it's mentioned before the end and then at the end. What did you understand by the ritual of fire? This may be a projection of my own cultural references, but for me, it was a sort of witch trial. I understood that if ever Pili accesses her power, then she'll be outcast as a witch. And there's a connection in my mind also between fire and water because they're opposing forces. That is true. Yeah, I think it's not exactly spelled out what the ritual would involve. There is stripping and burning, but it's certainly reminiscent of our old custom of burning women at the stake, which again is rooted in an absolute fear of female power. This takes us kind of towards the end of the story. And it's an interesting ending, isn't it? Very interesting. The idea of this ritual comes back. But how do we get there? How do we get to the end of the story? That's a really great point to highlight, because one of the remarkable things about this story is that Pili actually tells us what will happen. She's betrayed by Honey into cutting her hair. And then the, the sort of witch hunt that Pili has predicted manifests. Um, and it's somehow more shocking for that, because I suppose even at that stage, we're rather hoping for a different ending. There's an inevitability about that that's both satisfying and, and horrific, and all the more horrific for being so inevitable, I suppose. I was left with the impression that Pilly was just about to be punished for reaching to access her, her potential. And then the community mobilises around keeping Pilly's hair taboo, although it's ultimately punishing itself with this approach because Pilly's power could benefit everybody. Yes, I know that's the, the crazy thing. So as I was saying, it's as if female power is more to be feared than the uh, precious benefits it could bring, you know, it could potentially rescue the entire society. And yes, ultimately, Pili is betrayed and it's kind of a complex betrayal, multi-layered. Pili is betrayed by Honey, but also by her family, by the values of capitalism infiltrating modern Africa 
and by the traditional culture as well, if we think of the people gathering together to burn her as a witch. But underneath that, we sense an older Africa again that is responsible for the power in her hair that is possibly more female. So how kind of subversive or disruptive would you say this story is? That's a great question, because the story did appear in an anthology themed around disruption. I suppose it's disruptive in that it pushes us towards questioning, even though it seems like a status quo is reinforced at the end. I suppose you can't leave that story without seeing your own society a little bit differently, and that yeah. sense it unsettles. And the situation is unresolvable and probably the status quo cannot last either because of the nature of the desires that drive it. You know, that desire is not one that can be quenched. It can never have enough. What does perhaps, Seth, yeah. Yes. yeah, you mentioned Seth. This is perhaps... Well, I don't know whether that was your point or, or mine. What does Seth <laughs> And what does Honey want? I mean, what does Honey want? Seems incredible. She just wants Seth. <laughs> But ultimately, yeah, she she doesn't have the confidence to make the leap, I suppose, into another possible future, the future that we perhaps glimpse through the possibility of a healthy, interdependent relationship between Honey and Pili. She falls back on satisfying the desires of the powerful white man. Yes, it, it kind of eschews that happier ending, doesn't it? And I'm thinking now that I can imagine maybe a few years ago when a lot of feminist texts were writing about women coming together and that disrupting the patriarchal order, maybe a different kind of story would have been written. But this one is, in a sense, more... It's darker than that, isn't it? It's darker. There, There is not female solidarity, not from the mother to Pilly, not from honey to Pilly. Possibly mm. the aunt, but then we don't see the aunt. She's entirely off screen. I understood that something bad had happened to her. She seemed to uh-huh. have been Possibly, made to yes. disappear. Yeah. Yes. More, more ellipsis. But yeah, it's true that the story refrains from giving any, any easy answers, any uh, happy end. So, Livy, if somebody wanted to write a story like this one, how how would they set about it? What are the key features of Lehumio's style? Well, it's an exceptionally complex, layered style, incorporating symbolism and magic realism with a penetrating analysis of capitalism and colonialism. Like Tessa Hadley and Alice Munro, Lehumio creates different layers of reality through fantasy and mythology, weaving an older magical reality into a contemporary situation. And one world disrupts or erupts into another by means of symbolism, symbolism of the object, the hair, or symbolic acts or gestures. But the writer never forgets the political reality presented by the society and by the family. So it would be a hard job to actually uh, create a short story like this one. One thing I think you would not do is focus on the sentimental, the emotional, the relationship aspects. You see what I mean? It's all about the a very profound political and philosophical analysis of the situation that presents Africa itself as really complex and multi-layered. Another wonderful short story by an exceptional writer. Thank you for listening to this Small Pleasures podcast and do keep your eyes and ears open for our next. Watch this space. We have many great stories to cover. Until then, goodbye from me and from Sonia. A très bientôt.